I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be addressing some comments that were made after we did a recent episode where we dug into a bit of the concerns and things you need to think about when you're looking at housing, like buying a house, renting a home, moving to a new country for retirees or people who are looking towards retirement as a reason for making a move. There's a lot of considerations that are very important for people who are retiring, and it's a one-time change in your life that very few people are prepared for because it's a one-time change in your life, and it's a very dramatic one. And so Something we try not to think about very much. Either we fantasize about it or we don't think about it at all. And in most cases, we are not prepared for good, solid, logical decision making at a time when we probably more than ever need good, solid, logical decision making. So there were some comments about that that I think are very valuable and I want to address them in a long format. So we're going to do that today and we're going to get to that right after the bump. All right, today is a response video, but it's very topical, so we're going to do our best. But we're going to start right off by reading from Maximus75. That's probably Maximus. Uh, the main pro in buying rather than renting normally is that by buying, you make an initial higher investment that you plan or hope will pay off, but then you don't have to pay high monthly expenses, if any at all, while by renting, you commit to having higher monthly expenses, and still that money does not guarantee any discount for when you finally buy a house. It's just lost money in the common general view. Not sure, though, if this approach makes sense for Nicaragua. I've always been wanting to buy, but your arguments raise some doubts now. So that's a really good point, and that is how most people think. And there are cases where that is true, but it's important to look at this from an investment perspective rather than a someone's trying to sell you a house perspective. When we're looking at buying versus renting, the idea, the market pressures actually push them to be roughly equal. Now, in any given market, you're going to have some rental advantage or some buying advantage. And most of the time, this is either really close to even or or slightly uh, leaning towards renting is the overall advantageous thing for a lot of reasons. And the, underlying this is really important. If you were to have nothing but people who never moved and, and owners who never moved and a, in a completely static market, then you would find that it should be that over time renting and owning roughly equaled out and there wouldn't be a giant advantage to one or the other. Yes, people who rent out apartments do make some money, but they've also put in money investments up front it should be very close. It's not necessarily equal, but it's very close. But in a market where you have people who are migratory at all, you're going to lean towards renting, having an advantage because the people who rent have ways to make money that is above what they could do if they were in a static home, even if the housing market was even and there's actually the possibility of making money by renting out your house greater than there is from living in it, which throws things off. There's actually just a greater economy when you have rentals and people moving around. It's just able to, to create more revenue with the housing market itself not actually being what makes that revenue, but it doesn't get in the way of it the way that static housing would do. So it's con convoluted in that way, but it makes renting far more valuable than it seems on paper, because when we're on paper, we tend to only uh, compare very limited factors, which are not the major factors and not the most important factors for most people when looking at renting versus buying, but they're the ones that everyone presents because they provide the view that sells homes and that's what makes people money. And basically no one is going to uh, tell you good things for you if they don't get paid to do so, and nobody likes to pay for good advice, so the number of people who are going to give you honest advice that really addresses all of your needs are very few, what they're going to do is do whatever it takes to sell you something. Sales is the trick that fools most people. Everybody wants free advice. Free advice essentially only comes from salesmen. I get paid by YouTube for talking ad nauseum on videos, so it's a little bit different. I've also made a career of greater than 35 years of my entire career is advising businesses uh, in these exact kinds of things. Yes, I come from a technology background, but that is a part of business that does exactly this. We do risk assessments, financial advisory, all these things, they play into what we do every day. And I've done this for everything from small businesses and individuals to the Fortune 10, lots of the Fortune 10 and governments. So it's these are things that I really know and do. So breaking apart these common sales tactics, these common, the people all do these things, uh, uh, kind of paradigms is my specialty. And I think there's some really important value here and things that just people aren't going to tell you because people who have bought homes either are trying to sell you a home or they've bought a home. And by, if they told you that renting is better most of the time, 
they have to question their own decision making. And people don't like to do that. So it's very rare even to find people who've made decisions who are going to give you advice against what their decisions were, whether or not it was right for them and whether or not different factors make it right for you. So they just want to have support for their decisions. We see this a lot in business that people will say, well, I did this. And people will say, well, does this apply to me? And they'll just blanket say, yeah, you have to do what I did. And when you do an evaluation, any amount of, of looking at it shows that they actually failed and they probably knew that this not only would fail for you, but would be worse than for them. But there's such a, an unbelievable emotional pressure to push people to do the same things that we do to justify our decisions. You see this in um, how people go to university. You see it in when they get married, the ages that they do things. Like there's so many things that so much social pressure. Oh, you've got to do this. You've got to buy a house. You've got to. We make it a stigma not to do these things, but the stigma really comes not for the people who are being pushed to buy a house, but from the people who already decided to buy a house or the people who already went to university or the people who already got married and they want you to do the same things that they did because it makes it seem like they must have made a good decision themselves when in reality their decision is disconnected from yours and whether you do it or not has no reflection on whether it was a good decision for them. Here in Nicaragua, we have a lot of people that say, well, you really should buy in Nicaragua because the prices are so low. That leans things towards buying. And certainly low prices does make buying make more sense, except when the prices are low like they are here, the rental prices are low as well. They basically track together. So you can say, oh, I can buy a house for only $25,000, $30,000. That's amazing. I have to buy one. But then you say, wait, I can rent a house for only $150? Well, I have to rent one. Well, neither thing is true. Uh, both numbers are true, but the fact that you need to do one thing or the other is not. You still need to evaluate what makes sense for you. If you're going to be stable, you want to stay put for a really long time, you have a high confidence in that, and you're sure that the house you're going to buy, or at least the house and the land combination, the location, and all that is definitely what you're going to want for the very long haul, generally we mean 20 plus years, then by all means, buying could be the right thing for you. You have to weigh all the factors that may come into it, but that's completely possible. Uh, if you can't say all those things, if you're, well, I'm not sure I want to stay there. I'm not sure I don't want to upsize. I'm not sure my job's not going to change. I'm not sure I'm not going to retire. Then renting probably makes sense. This is the same thing that we should be teaching 18 year olds or 65 year olds. It doesn't matter. The logic of what makes buying make sense remains the same. It is, do you have enough time with essentially guaranteed stability with no, no worries of there being a major life change that you control or don't control that may change where you want to live, how you want to live, how you're going to interact with your house, you, an emergency need to sell it or anything like that. Now here in Nicaragua, the low prices do uh, make things feel like buying could be better. And in some ways it can, but it also makes selling harder. There's very few houses selling on the market. Things stay on the market for a very long time. So if you're in a position where, yes, you have some money, yes, you can buy a house, but you worry that you may have to sell it to be able to move on somewhere because you need to get that money back out. Well, if you're in the United States, you get used to the idea, well, I put up $200,000 into a house. Yeah, maybe, maybe the market won't do great, but if I need to sell that house for $200,000, I can get my money back nearly all of it, maybe a little bit extra, no problem. But here in Nicaragua, you could easily end up in a situation where you're saying, okay, I can, I will need to get my money back out of the house. I've owned it for a couple of years and then find that it takes three or five or 10 years to find a buyer willing to take the house at any price, let alone a good one. And you easily could end up losing money on the house because eventually you're going to get desperate and you're going to take a lower offer because people can wait years. There's always something they can buy. There's always something on a discount. So unless you have a really desirable house and a person who really wants that house and is willing to pay extra for it, you're probably in a position where you're, you just don't have the capability to convince people to buy your house. And so you're either gonna go really cheap or wait a really long time to be able to sell it or both. Those things can tie up your assets, which if you're young and you can go work an extra job and spend a little bit of time, you know, scraping things together to figure out how to own two houses while you figure out how to sell the one, well, maybe you can do that. But when you're on fixed income in retirement, you probably don't have the energy to work a second job or any job, potentially. You may not have the uh, fixed income to be able to afford two places. You may have to sell that house. You may need that money for some flexibility in your life and you may not control the factors that change. And so that makes uh, some of that buffer and that hedge that you have when you're younger go away. So even uh, all apples to apples in retirement, you need to be a little bit more cautious of tying up your, your physical financial assets in such a way that you don't have the flexibility to move them around as needed because you can't always predict how you're going to need them. 
Now, there are lots of reasons why people just want houses, and some of them are very good reasons. Like, you want a chance to be able to work on it yourself, expand it yourself. You just really find that working on houses or improving houses is, is your hobby. Maybe you really like customizing the house, and you want to put a bunch into it because you have very special needs, and finding houses that you want on the market is very difficult. You Maybe you really want a swimming pool, but you want to live in an area where there just aren't any swimming pools on the market, or at least not to rent, and that leaves you in a position where what are you going to do? Rent a place and put in a pool for them? We could do that, but that would be generally pretty silly to do. So you can get stuck in scenarios where, yes, you want to buy a house because you want something you just can't have unless you do buy a house, and that's realistic. So it's important to understand that if we just run numbers, purely financial decisions, we're generally going to find, and still exceptions exist, but on average, way more than 50% of the time, we're going to find that renting is the better decision. This is for anyone across the market. But as we near retirement, we should see the, the scales tip towards renting heavily because like we said in the other video, when you come into retirement, you have a number of factors. You have a life change that you, no matter how much you plan for, you cannot ever truly predict. You have a lot of potential changes that come very rapidly during that time, including uh, unknown financial situations, unknown health situations, um, unknown family situations. There's just a lot more to potentially have go wrong. And then anytime you're moving to a new country, those same things exist. You're looking at potentially changes to your lifestyle, to your finances, to any number of things. And so in either case that you're looking at entering or being new to retirement and not having had time to uh, uh, adjust to that, or you're coming into a new country and you haven't had time to adjust to all the ways that that's going to change your lifestyle, you should be leaning away from buying until you've had enough time to really make good decisions. And the more that you say, but I'm in a hurry to buy a house for and name the reason, the more that should tell you that you probably need more time to make good decisions because the more it feels like you're in a hurry, the more important a house is, the more important it is that you get it right. Now, conventional knowledge tells you that owning a house makes you money over time. And there are cases where this is true, but on average, it just is a break even. Owning a house is not the big windfall that people pretend it is. They do this by comparing the alternative of just throwing money away, but that is not how it works. When you buy a house, you one, you pay much more, if assuming you have a mortgage, you pay much more than you believe you do. Right? You don't generally look at the total number that you're going to spend over time. You look at just maybe you look at your monthly payments. All these things are very misleading. Right? You have to look at full numbers over a long course of time. And it's easy to say that renting goes up over time and mortgages do not. Yes, to some degree, but also houses wear out and need maintenance, a lot of maintenance. As a person who's owned a number of houses, I have put so much money into house maintenance that one could easily argue that renting is cheaper because those landlords who rent generally have multiple properties, do some of the work themselves, uh, have some scale to work work from and they're able to do repairs more cost effectively than you are on your own. And because they're a business, maybe they're able to hedge against it a little bit better. Uh, and, and whatever, it's at least not your problem. As a homeowner, you face things like, what if you have a fire? What if there's a flood? What if your roof gets damaged? What if any number of things? People have to do major home repairs on a regular basis. I own homes right now. I have major repairs I have to do. I wish I rented sometimes. And I do. Where I rent, it's never a problem. It's very predictable. I know exactly what I'm going to spend. And I'm able to keep my price down. Where I own outright, I literally spend more in maintenance per month than I spend renting my house. So that's an extreme example, but it's important to understand that maintenance and ongoing home issues may outstrip the benefits that people just calculate that away. They act as though there is no cost to owning a house when there isn't a mortgage. And the mortgage is generally, yes, the major cost, but not the only one by any stretch. The other numbers are normally pretty significant. And if we discount those, it's going to be very misleading. Of course, it's going to make, if we don't count anything else, of course, home ownership is going to look better most of the time, nearly always. But those aren't the most significant factors in the long haul. The other thing that happens is people consider all the money and effort that they put into a house uh, that they then rent instead. They think all that money that's being spent on rent is yeah, they don't put in all this money up front like they do in a house, but they save money later. But if you had that money to put into a house, if you had the ability to buy a house, you also have the ability to take that money and invest it in something that's a bit more reliable, like an index fund, as an example. That's what you have to compare against. Instead of saying, well, I didn't use this money to buy a house, or I did use this money to buy a house, of course, investing in something versus investing in nothing tends to favor the investing in something. But that is never what you actually compare against. That's a in contrived scenario specific 
specifically for people who know that buying a house is a bad thing and they're trying to lie about it. There's no other case that you would do that. You would always take the amount of money you're able to put into a house, say it's uh, 20% or 50%, whatever, and if you're down here looking at places in Nicaragua, often it's 100%, and you have to compare the reasonable baseline alternative, and that is putting that number into an index fund. Of course, you could do something even better with it if you want to, but this is the conservative baseline that we use for all financial calculations of what is making money versus what is losing money. If you do anything else, it's contrived to falsify the numbers. This is the one reasonable baseline of what you can reasonably always do with conservative investing. And with that, you generally make on average, and it definitely fluctuates, about 9% a year on average over a long period of time. And when you're talking about mortgages, you're definitely talking about at least several years, if not a couple decades. So when we're looking at that, it really skews the numbers a lot. Instead of saying, ah, oh, my 20000 is put into a house and I pay less later, or my 20000 is just used on beer, that's not what you actually do. You put it into this index fund and then look at what 9% compounded year after year after year after year is going to do. And yes, yeah, sometimes buying a house is still the better financial decision. Absolutely. When I say that buying a house is sometimes good, that's what we're assuming it's against. But you have to do that to understand when it's a good decision versus when it's not. And so if you're not doing that, you're not really looking at when a house is a good financial decision versus just sounding emotionally fulfilling. And emotional fulfillment is worth something, but it's also important to remember that when we're talking about finances and risk and housing and those things, emotional fulfillment while important, is also super dangerous, and it tends to push us to do things that we should logically know are putting us at risk. And if we're being smart, yeah, we know there's going to be risk to get the things that we want. Sometimes I want, just want to own a nice chair. I want to have a nice computer. I want to have a new video game. Are it going to make me money? No. Is it emotionally fulfilling? I hope so. Well, I'm going to spend $20 on this video game versus the time I'm going to spend on it. Is it a good deal? You know, we know how to calculate those things. But when we're looking at a house, often it's such a big thing and we dream so much about it and we're so scared of the financial numbers and trying to figure out what they are that we sometimes just look the other way and hope for the best. And of all the decisions we make in our life, the big ones like homes and university and marriage are not ones where we should bury our head in the sand. We should go into it logically and say, does this make sense for us? Not rush into it and just look the other way and hope for the best after the fact. All right, and the second comment from knows he does not know. Hey, Scott, although I believe you take a great care in thinking out the points you will elucidate in most of your content, I believe your tender age has led you astray when it comes to retirement and housing considerations. I don't have the space to respond to many of your points, but when you get closer to or at the retirement or years into retirement, having a solid foundation like your own house or condo provides invaluable stability and security. Now, that's the first point I'm going to argue that that's absolutely not what it does. That's why I warn is because it gives the sense of stability without actually giving you stability. Being concerned with having to move in your 70s or 80s is not where most people want to be. Exactly. That's why I warn against putting yourself in a dangerous situation. If you must, that's another situation. But why live in fear? Exactly. Uh, the problem is, is that fear often comes from not having calculated a scenario and emotional reaction rather than actually protecting yourself. Many people are afraid of flying but they know that flying is safer than driving. So often it's important to live in fear to keep yourself safe. I think you have to approach your personal finances like you would your business, exactly. That is, follow your heart with great confidence, but have some sort of backup plan just in case. Now, I talked about this and he clarified a little bit, so give him a second. If you're always going to worry about changing your mind, you're going to miss out on a lot of things, in my opinion. Okay, maybe. The other point is that although you may not have any idea of what you might want in retirement, I believe that most people have a pretty good idea. I would argue that that's not true. I think very few people have a good idea, but okay, maybe he's right. Personally, I would like a nice small house within a mile or two of the ocean. I love to design, fix up, and maintain my home. Now that's important. He specifically has a very specific, and, and a lot of people have this same specific thing. He really likes working on his home, and I mentioned that earlier. So, so that's there's no way around it. Like sometimes you're buying a house as part of your hobby, right? Or part of your business, it could be, right? So th that is a very important consideration. If, you have, if you're a renter, that may not make sense. However, I would also argue if that's something you really like, consider ha buying a rental property of your own, renting where you live and having rental properties, something that I do myself, right? So that's a real thing. Uh, so the way I look at it is if I cannot be happy with a beautiful, affordable home close to magnificent beaches and just about anything you might need, then I've got a big problem and it is not housing. So as long as you are not derelict in picking a location, the most important possession you need is that U-Haul is your happiness. The most important thing in your U-Haul is your happiness. So he has a lot of good points, right? It's not, it's not that he's wrong. It's that I think there's important alternative ways to look at some of this um, and it can end up 
uh, being a little bit misleading. Now I came back and said, yep, uh, I made some comments about following your heart. And he clarified, actually, follow your heart, this is still him, does not imply making an emotional decision. Instead, it means seeing with clarity. Okay, we should argue that that is uh, thinking logically, I think is a better way to put it. This leads to the best decisions because they are based on an appreciation of things much closer to the truth of the matter. All right, and then uh, we have one additional follow-up that he did. This one's a little bit lengthy. Uh, you ask if, because he said, if, if buying is cheap, why wouldn't you do it? And I said, well, by that logic, if renting is cheap, why wouldn't you do that? He said, uh, you ask, if renting is cheap, why wouldn't you do that? And I believe this gets down to the crux of the matter, renting versus owning. You don't want to own if it's not prudent. I agree. But there are so many reasons, money aside, why owning is a good thing. After all, the U.S. was the envy of the planet when nearly ever, anybody with a decent job could afford a decent home back in the day. Now, this gets into, yes, but does this apply to retirees? Does this apply to the situation? I don't know. Not so much today, because homes are not what they used to be in all kinds of ways. But having your own home taught young people responsibility while setting priorities. I would argue that that's not true. I think just owning a house, it, the opposite, not owning a house also teaches them responsibility and setting priorities. Owning a house is one path to that. It's kind of like if you go to university, well, you're going to learn things. Yes, but if you have to go work without going to university, you also learn things and probably more in many cases, especially in my industry where we look at university as an escape from education rather than a path to it, right? Home ownership could be your path away from greater responsibility. Well, now you don't have to think about moving. You don't have to worry about those changes of jobs because you're tied into your house. It creates an excuse to do less. So I would argue that it's not that it's bad, but that not that it's good in the way that he's describing. It was also a reasonable way for the majority to build some wealth also, I don't know if that's true. It's something that they sold people on. But like I said in the first section, and I say all the time, and I've argued with housing advisors that that is generally a scam. The idea that you build a house, uh, build wealth by owning a house is not completely untrue. A house can be a mechanism to that, but it is a mostly just a reflection of your age rather than the house itself creating that wealth by being a house. Had you rented, like I said, and invested the extra money that you would have spent on the mortgage, on the uh, down payment, all that in an index fund or some other way, started a business with it, for example, you normally would have been far ahead overall. So the house actually, in math terms, is a path to cripple your, your wealth, not create it in most cases. But it can be a tool towards creating it, but it's important to understand it is a tool, it is a financial vehicle, and that means it comes with risk. And because it's so conservative in the, in the absolute sense, meaning it doesn't have wild fluctuations, that means you're actually taking a bigger risk with your finances that it's harder to actually have them make profit. And again, this was before Westerners decided that they were not interested in learning how to do much of anything. Remember how the globalist cabal came out several years ago and stated to younger folks, you will own nothing and you will be happy. How's that working out? Well, actually, it's fantastic. Being free of consumerism is one of the paths to wealth. It is one of the paths to happiness. And I think all the generations that really there aren't any generations that have escaped consumerism, but not owning things is fantastic. Every person who doesn't own things talks about how free they are and how much more money they have and how much more flexibility they have, that they're able to experience life and not spend their life chasing money in order to buy things that they don't need. So I think his example is really strange here, but it points out how emotionally driven and how trickery capitalism tends to push owning a house, not because it's good for you, but because it's good for the banks and it's good for the government. So I think this is a great example. Yes, owning things is really bad in general. We as a society have done all kinds of damage to ourselves by owning too many things. Individuals are hurt by owning too many things. And if you move to Nicaragua, I've said this in a lot of videos, one of the things that happens really quickly when you move to Nicaragua from everyone I know is instantly we go from having so many things. When I moved from the United States, I have a storage unit that has more things in it than I own in Nicaragua, but I've lived here for years without them. I don't need any of them except for a couple things that are memorabilia, nostalgic items from when my kids were little, like, yeah, I want those back. But in general, all that stuff, none of it is stuff I need. I've learned to live with less and I'm happier because I don't have to pack it. I don't have to move it. I don't have to worry about it being insured. I don't sit around worrying about things. I get to experience my life. I and everyone I know constantly talk about how much happier we are that our spending goes down, our buying power goes up, and our desire to just shop, 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 to have ownership be the thing that, that gives us value has gone away. We now value our interpersonal relationships. We value talking to people, our time that we're able to spend. If you end up in retirement, as many people do, suddenly deciding you want to travel, you want to spend time on the beach, or you want to fix up your house, all those things are hindered by owning a lot of things. Now, if you want to fix up your house, owning a house is necessary, but owning other things is not. 
that whole idea that we're finally defeating industrial capitalist ideas. And it's not capitalism as an investment idea. That's great. I like it a lot. Nicaragua's all about investment. We're way more capitalistic than the United States. They don't have blind investment the way the U.S. does. We have uh, much more uh, direct private equity ownership. It's just a different approach. But from a how many people are investors in their own businesses, Nicaragua's way ahead of the U.S. How well those businesses do and how much money they make, yeah, it's behind. But from a pure capitalism standpoint, this is where capitalism is happening. But without the consumerism, there isn't this drive to just own lots of things. So I think he made the perfect example here that it is so easy to become emotionally tied to things. And that's exactly what I'm warning about with houses. It's so easy to see it as another thing that defines us that so many people will just rush to buy one because they think they need that house to define them. And I understand why people feel that way, but that's a dangerous, reckless emotional decision, especially as we go into retirement and retirees are more susceptible to things like that. So it's really important, so much more important, so magnified as you approach retirement that it takes someone in many cases at a younger age to say, whoa, I need to remember, I need to make this video to remind myself when I am older, if I haven't already owned a house, that is a bad time to be buying a house. I need to be really cautious because I'm likely to be super motivated to buy one and I likely won't be thinking about how unbelievably unnecessary it is because I'll think that's what I want. All right, back to, in any case, let's have this conversation in 20 years when you're about my age. I kind of believe you might be living in your own house then. So he's probably true, but I'm, I already have houses. So I already have a plan of where I'm going to live at retirement and I'm working on it in my 40s and I started working on it in my early 40s. So I'm not making a decision for retirement uh, at the time of retirement. I'm making a decision now that only makes sense because I'm writing it out into retirement. If when I get to retirement, I sell everything and then suddenly buy something and move to a new place at the time of retirement, that's when he'll be right and be like, yeah, see, you, you made huge changes and made a purchase at that time that you're warning people about, but I'm specifically setting things up so that I don't do that now. If, if you're making plans for what you think your retirement's going to be like 20 years before, and you're getting that value, you're getting that purchase, you're protecting against a whole bunch of those unknowns and able to build during those safety years so that when you reach retirement, you already own a house. Absolutely, don't run out and sell your house and go to rent just because you're retiring. That's not at all what we're recommending. We're recommending when you're relocating to a new country, don't use that opportunity that you're triggered because of retirement, right? You're moving to a new country because of retirement. Don't also do the thing where you buy a house as part of that move. Don't, don't rush at that moment because retirement and relocation are the times to stop and take immense care of all the times in your life. They are the most dangerous to go out and purchase a house quickly. I do hear what you're saying and agree that if you're uncertain of your path, then renting is the way to go. But if no one ever took chances, we would all be still in Africa complaining about the heat instead of, I guess, in Nicaragua complaining about the heat as we do. And thank you, as always, for the incredible information you provide. Yeah, he's true, right? You got to take some chances, but you also need to be cautious because this is a very big risk. And it's a big risk that for most people isn't based on what they actually need. It's very difficult to ascertain that this is the, you know, I, I know right at retirement, right at the time that I'm relocating, either one, that I know where I'm gonna wanna live, that I know what the environment is like, right? So he's talking about, he wants to be about one to two miles from the beach, great. That's a really big area, right, here in Nicaragua. That is like something like five or 600 miles of zone and wide by, well, a mile. Uh, so that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square miles of, of countryside and does he want to be near a city? Does he want to be near a highway? Does he want to be in what kind of weather? And it takes time to understand how long it takes to drive places. You can look at a map and say, well, this place is near this beach, and but what is it like? What's the microcosm? What is the traffic like? What are the neighbors like? What is your health like? What is the construction material like? What is, there's so many things. And how is it going to change over time? Not everything is something you can control or foresee. And I understand you cannot stop your entire life and say, well, I don't know everything. I, I don't have foresight, so I'm never going to buy. I'm never going to settle down. I'm never. No, you can't do that. He's right. You have to take chances at some point. But there's a difference between taking chances and being cautious and careful, especially at a moment where you're creating a bunch of upheaval and the things that you do control are at one point up for change, right? Under all circumstances, there are things you don't control. 
You could be 18 years old, have a million dollars in the bank, you decide to go buy a house. You can't control necessarily what neighbors are going to move in next to you. You can't control what the weather patterns are going to be like in the future. You, know, you can't control what highway is going to change because, you know, where I grew up, my father had uh, a major highway really close to his house and then it shifted. Now, in his case, it shifted away, but it could have shifted towards him and come right through the property, right? You could have made a huge investment and then had to move because things came through. So one of the things that he said earlier in this is you don't want to be in your 70s or 80s and worrying about moving. Absolutely. Absolutely, I cannot agree more. That's why a house is scary. Because if you own a house, one, you're much more afraid of anything that might happen because you're tied to a physical possession. You're worried that the house could fall down, that there could be a flood, that there could be a fire. All those things could destroy everything that you've built. All of your nest egg is in something you don't have really good solid protection over. Houses are risky things. And if anything happens, let's say your health changes and you need to be near a different hospital, you have a family emergency and you need to move, not only do you need to move, and it's something you can't control, the house hasn't protected you. The the house will then be a hindrance. You may not have the capability to move where you need. You may have to move. And what happens if there's a problem with your deed or you're not able to make your, your tax payments or who knows what could happen in the future? Owning a house does not give security. I know it sounds like that. We've been taught by people who prey on consumers that owning things gives security, but owning things doesn't give you security. Owning things makes them own you. We say this all the time. And I also say, don't listen to contrived statements. They're just random words that sound good. And so it's just a thing we say, but we know that it's true. When you own things, we become emotionally attached to them simply by owning them. Read the book Predictably Irrational. It's a really good read on how the human brain works. And accepting that that's how our brain works is a really important way in controlling ourselves logically. Understanding that the very act of owning a house makes you emotionally tied to that house in irrational ways and will cause you to make bad financial and personal protection decisions because you're trying to protect a house. You will end up feeling that that house's value is higher to you than its value is on the market. That makes it dangerous. It doesn't mean you shouldn't own a house, but it means you have additional risk that you cannot avoid because all humans' brains works this way. And you can tell if you're going to be extra affected by this, because if you say, well, that doesn't affect me, that won't happen to me, that means you're that much more likely that you're unable to recognize the normal chemical processes that happen in your brain and you're perceiving them as logical when in fact they are illogical and it's just how we are accepting that we are illogical creatures is the first step towards what little bit of logic we're able to have that's a very different discussion but it's very important when we're talking about how we are emotionally manipulated by ourselves by others uh, and especially in a situation when you're getting a house you have lots of people who are salespeople. a lot of people make money when you make a, a house transaction and all of them are going to push very hard for you not to listen to me because they make their money by convincing you to do something that hurts yourself they make their money off of you and you're the one who loses this is the time that you want to protect against things. By owning a house, you have the least protection. Renting does not mean that you just have to move. I don't know where that idea comes from. I've never rented a place and then had to move because my rental was up. That's not how it works. Most people who rent stay for a really long time until they want to move. If you have to move, generally it's because of something other than your apartment. Now, it's not 100% true. I have known people who've rented and suddenly weren't able to rent anymore because they, the people renting the house or whatever decided they weren't going to rent to them anymore but that is not the normal situation generally if you have good renters you want to keep them because whatever made you want to rent the place to them in the first place is just gets better and better the longer you have them the longer you know them your profits start to get better over time if you have people changing over all the time that's how you lose money so people who are renting homes or apartments they don't want turnover they just want the place not to be empty and you represent the best case for that once you're in. So under normal circumstances, everybody wins when you're renting, but you are protected against things like, what if you own a house and you don't have enough money to fix the roof or there's a foundation damage and then you may have to move. But if it's a place that a business is renting to you, they are generally prepared or at least on the hook for fixing those things. And if they can't fix those things, yes, you may have to move, but you would have to move either way. But in this case, you aren't financially strapped. You're simply having to go through the effort of moving. This is Nicaragua, just hire someone to move you for you and since you won't probably own nearly as much stuff you don't have that fear again if you own a bunch of things they're gonna make a house feel like you something you need so you can store all your stuff in it and suddenly you need a bigger house you're more tied to that house you're afraid of moving but if you don't own as much if you're like me and now have a very small lifestyle the ability to move whenever I want is pretty easy and I don't fear it at all now of course you can argue that I never really felt fear in moving and that is absolutely true and for a number of years I lived out of 11 suitcases that was me my wife and my two kids 11 in suitcases is all we had to live out of for three years and it was absolutely fantastic but more importantly 
when you get older, when you go through retirement, at no point are you likely to have really long stretches of time where you have no changes. Now, if you retire super early, you may have quite a bit more time. But if you're retiring, especially later, 65, 70, 75, then chances are you're going to have a number of changes throughout your retirement years that come pretty close together. And they don't give you enough time to justify owning a house in a lot of cases before the likelihood of something causing you to want to change will happen. Now, I'm not saying that that's something dramatic it could be as simple as you no longer like going to the beach or maybe you like going to the beach and you want to be really close maybe you like being away from people or near people those things shift as you go through those years it could be that you like going up and downstairs and then you don't it could be that you need to be near a certain hospital and and then a different one later because your doctor moves or because a uh, new hospital is built like here in Leon suddenly oncology uh, patients can move to Leon instead of being in Managua that's a new thing right so a lot of things are changing because just life changes Life changes around you and you change as you go through these years and your needs change both based on your health and your age and your investments and your experiences of being in retirement and your experiences of being in Nicaragua. There's so many things that will happen under these specific conditions that you're moving to Nicaragua or any place at the time of retirement that renting is a massive hedge against uncertainty and the idea that you can be certain, yes, Maybe the person who wrote this really does know themselves well enough that they can make a really good decision that their hobby of working on the house uh, supersedes all the other concerns and that's what's going to make them happy. And that's okay. And you might be that person too. But it's important to understand that all the other reasons, all those, it makes me feel safe. It makes me feel like a good financial investment. It makes it seem like stability. It makes it seem like I don't have to move. It seems like owning things is good. All of those things are emotional trickery. All of them are bad, all of them are risky, all of them are costly. And all those are things you have to overcome when you own a house to justify whether or not it makes sense for you. So especially during retirement, you want to take a lot of caution. And I think of a lot of this very firsthand. My business partner has uh, started his process of retirement. Uh, now he's a little bit on the young side for retirement, but he's well into the potential retirement years. And one of the first things that happened is we went in a number of weeks from discussions about building houses and making big long-term plans to, well, you know, the option to travel is really there. And I don't know if if I need the space and I want to just get out and start traveling and it's happening really rapidly at the thought processes that understanding what the future could bring he went from ah I might retire sometime soon to every decision in his life is changing really rapidly all in a matter of weeks and that's an extreme case but those are the kinds of things that happen during retirement when my father first retired he was happy to live on the farm that I grew up on it seemed like well he'd lived there for a really long time he'd like to keep it that you know owning a house for 40 plus years was you know stability and all the things that's described but once he did a few years in retirement it was ooh I think I need to get rid of this. I don't need all this space. I don't need all this headache. I don't need all this risk, even having owned it for a long time. It still resulted in there's so many costs. There's so many unknowns. There's so much work. And all those things get worse in retirement. You have to deal with more contractors and you don't want to be putting yourself in a position of being taken advantage of, which is more likely to happen when you're retired. You don't want to be doing as much physical labor around the house. You want to do as much as you can, but the amount you can do will decline over time. All these things happen and suddenly those beautiful houses that you loved at one point may become a burden and it becomes just another thing that you own that is actually owning you. It's taking up your time, it's taking up your happiness, and most importantly, well, probably your happiness, but also importantly, it, it creates risk and hurts your financial power. And so my father made the decision to move into a small apartment in the middle of a village. We'd always lived on a farm basically his entire life, not his entire life, but really close to it. And, and in retirement, he decided to live right uh, in inside a, a good sized village of about 7,000 people. And uh, it's been a fantastic move for him. I think he has a small apartment that he really likes. It's easy for him to manage big items like the roof or the foundation. He has to worry about those things. And he has a, a company that rents it to him and they handle all those big expenses. He never has to worry about getting surprised. He reasonably never has to worry about moving. He's far less likely to be in a position where he has to move someday than if he lived on the farm. If he lived on the farm, so many things could happen to his health, to his a lifestyle to just whatever that would cause him to have to move whereas living in the apartment is much more predictable and he has a lot more stability because he's renting 
and because he's renting something that's so well designed for his retirement years and he's in a location that makes a lot of sense it's very easy for him to get to medical care it's very easy for him to go shopping it's very easy for him to just all the things that he needs to do are as easy as possible he can get delivery really easily all things that on the farm were very difficult or unavailable so those it's just another example of uh going through retirement and seeing those things and yes i am probably a long way from retirement most likely but I do want to plan ahead and I do understand that when I get to retirement, I'm going to go through these same changes and suddenly I'm going to say, wait, I don't need to sit in my office all day. Wait, I don't need to work. Wait, I don't have the same considerations. All the things that I planned for in my housing prior to that point may not apply anymore. And suddenly as I start having free time during retirement, if that ever happens, I will be reevaluating what my free time looks like and I will very likely want a different living situation than the one I thought I was going to have for decades before. If you ask me for the last 30 years, I've had basically the same vision of what my retirement would be. But as I get to retirement, I know that that is the trigger that will cause me to have different visions for it. Nothing I do planning ahead is likely to really build a good vision of what my retirement will best look like. You may be different. You may be the exception. This is a kind of thing that really does have exceptions. It's not like sometimes we say you're not the, like sometimes it's like the 99%. This is not like that, but it's like the 80%, the 85%. You have to be in that 10 to 15% who might be able to truly predict. And of course you never know if you predicted right because you can't try all the alternatives, but it is definitely the rarity, but not unheard of that buying a house and settling down and having everything planned out is going to work out best for you. So I caution you, that's the most important thing. I caution you from rushing and I always do this, but just keep in mind that both retirement and relocation, these are life events that should make you have big red flashing lights. Don't buy now. This is the worst time in your life to buy. And to put them on top of each other, the chances that buying is right for you at that moment, it doesn't mean never, it means at that moment is practically zero. So protect yourselves. Don't listen to salespeople. Don't give in to emotions when they don't make sense. Be aware that you are going to be illogical. I'm illogical. You're illogical. That is something we can't escape. That's humanity. Don't act like you're a Vulcan. You're not. You are going to be manipulated by your own brain into doing things that are not necessarily good for you because they feel good because our caveman brain is trying to think in caveman terms and owning a cave when you never are going to wander more than a kilometer away from it is a pretty practical thing. But in this world where we move at just huge distances at the drop of a hat very easily and that will only get easier in the future having ourselves tied down presents a risk in our lives that our brains are not prepared to accept thanks for joining me like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel and help me be prepared for retirement you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash scott allen miller that would mean a lot to me we are not doing a live show this week i think i already mentioned that we may have already missed it but i am going to be live on channel 8 at 8 a.m on the 30th of april hopefully this gets out and you see this before that happens maybe it'll be after i don't actually know if you would take a moment to uh, share this on social media, tell a friend and family member about the show. I will see all of you tomorrow. Fantastic. And if you want to help support the show a little bit more, there's going to be four videos on the screen. Just click on one of those and that would help us a lot.